All right, we've got a great interview for you guys today. Rosalind Wiseman, uh, it's uh, a really interesting topic that I want to find out a lot about. Uh, there's uh, two books that actually were published at the same time with two different audiences in mind. Uh, it's, uh, the main book is called Masterminds and Wingmen, Helping Our Boys Cope with Schoolyard Power, Locker Room Tests, Girlfriends, and the rule, New Rules of Boy World. And then the guide, which is more for the actual boys, uh, managing douchebags, recruiting wingmen, and attracting who you want. Uh, that uh, obviously caught my interest. <laughs> okay, now you gotta know Rosalind uh, was also the author of Queen Bees and Wannabes, and that is the book that led to Mean Girls. So th that turned out nicely. <laughs> so you tackled uh, girls there, now you're tackling boys, mm -hmm. uh, in a manner of speaking. And, and so let's get right to it. First of all, uh, masterminds and wingmen, what does that mean? What's a mastermind, what's a wingman? <laughs> <laughs> well, a mastermind is a boy who has a lot of charisma and he has control over the boys' movements and what they think they're gonna think is cool. So if you're an eighth grade boy, for example, whoever gets up from the, from the table when they're done eating, that's your mastermind. He gets to control the movements of the group. But it goes to everything from like, you know, your shoes to the girls that are hot to um, how much ridicule the group can have without somebody saying like, okay, we're overboard. Um, it, you know, there's a, and it, what's amazing about masterminds is, and this is what the boys told me that I worked with, is that it wasn't just the high social status boys that had this. Mm -hmm. It was if you had a group of boys between, you know, about five boys in a, in a group, there would be one kid who had that power. Mm -hmm. um, the wingman is actually, the reason I put that in there is because it was one of the first times that I really argued with my editors. I want wingman to be a term that is like a throwback about supporting you on your wing no matter where you go, right? Mm -hmm. Well, my boy editors said to me, yeah, that's only when we want need help you know getting a girl so that's the only way we use that word <laughs> and I want to expand I want to expand the definition to just you know to be on get you know hitting on a girl I want it or hitting on somebody it's I want it to be you know your wingman is somebody that supports you through thick and thin yeah now it's it's funny because as I'm reading the uh, book I read the guide and uh, uh, there was a lot that struck like okay that's my group okay and we got a lot of alpha males in my group so it's a, like they don't fit necessarily neatly into all the categories but nonetheless we have a mastermind who we will not do anything without okay he we go on uh, to this day 30 years later with my group of friends from high school we go on a yearly trip okay, okay? if this guy doesn't authorize the trip we're not going <laughs> Okay. He tells you your, your trip idea is stupid. Yeah. Well, no, he will come up with the idea, he will execute the plan, okay, we it. will follow along uh -huh. like sheeple, okay? Uh -huh. Because he's the mastermind. Right. Okay. Right. But the mastermind doesn't necessarily have to be the coolest guy, the guy mm -hmm. who gets the most girls, mm -hmm. etc. But I always thought if you're the mastermind, why don't you figure that part out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually also think that you know boys can play and guys can play different roles, mm -hmm. and that really what I've always noticed and the guys have told me is that you know things actually can be pretty subtle until there's a moment of conflict or decision has to be made, and then the roles come really up like super super strong. So the question I would ask you is like, well, so the other guys in the group have they ever had another idea? Did they always want to do the idea that the mastermind wanted to do? Yeah. So okay. So that's a great question. What what winds up happening is that that he has beaten dissent out of us over the last 35 years, okay? And here's what I mean by that. It, he's done it by being right, okay? Uh, so, mm -hmm. so uh, if he's going in a direction that uh, we don't, I don't want, for example, I, it's what we call a hidden agenda. Like, he's the master of hidden agendas, right? So, if let's say he wants to go to the strip club and we want to go to the casino, okay? Mm -hmm. He's, he'll say, oh, let's go get gas from over there. And I'm like, well, I know what's happening. <laughs> There's no way that the gas station you're pointing to isn't right next to the strip club you want to go to, right? So, but, you know, he's been consistently right enough where I go, okay, I see all your hidden agendas, and I agree. <laughs> okay. Or maybe it's just easier to let him do what he wants to do. Right. No, no, he's, he's got our best interests in mind. So the mastermind doesn't have to be a bad person, doesn't have to be Dick Cheney. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's a really important thing. He does not have to be Dick Cheney. Absolutely not. I mean, I think that's the thing that I, a lot of people get really freaked out about. It. Like, oh, you're, this kid is really, really bad. This kid is not bad. No. Not, yeah. you know, it's really, it's these moments of like, he's really really charismatic, he's got really good ideas, um, the kids like him. I mean, as far as parenting goes, I think lots of times parents think, oh, this kid's like a bad influence and he's 100% a bad influence. And then they forget, especially in terms of their own child, 
that yeah, he might know that like 90% of the guy is a mess, but 10% is actually pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem that clear cut. Like there, or it doesn't even have to be that kind of a split, that there's good things about this kid. Mm -hmm. I think adults actually, for the most part, are the ones that we often put people in ways that are more extreme than the kids, because the kids sometimes actually see negotiate or see the gray, where adults don't. Like you're a bad influence, you're a bad kid, you're done, right? Well, look, it seems like the parents are far more of a pain in the ass than the kids are, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For so many, for a couple of reasons. Okay. I mean, yeah. one is they've completely lost their sense of humor, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. other is they will not, it's very difficult for parents to admit when they're wrong, mm -hmm. when they've uh, made a mistake, and when they've lied. Really hard. In fact, when that happens, they usually double down, okay. and then it gets even worse. Whereas for kids, and this is the reason I've always loved working with teenagers, is that when, you know, people lie, right? They do. And so when you catch a young person in a lie, <laughs> There's this moment of like, come on, dude, like give me a break. Right. And I mean, it depends on what that lies about. But for the most part, young people, I feel, are much more um, willing to admit and acknowledge what they've done if you're not judgmental and if you're direct with them. But man, with adults and with parents sometimes, especially if they use the whole de defense of you mess with my kids so I can do whatever I want. It justifies any yep. kind of bad, unethical behavior. As soon as they have gotten to that place, they have lost their mind. Mm -hmm. But this whole mama bear, daddy bear kind of thing is also, has also become almost a political statement. Like it's a sound bite of justification of the most irresponsible, mm -hmm. ridiculous behavior. Yeah, and it's always the gut reaction of, not my kid. Well, why wouldn't it be your kid? It's somebody's kid that's doing it, right? Yeah. And really, as a parent <laughs> of two boys, myself, that are 13 and 11, it is often, I can't, how many times I can say, yeah, it could be my child. It really could be my kid. Right. And um, the moment you start thinking or refuse to even think about these kinds of issues, you know, it's like stuff's gonna hit you upside the head. So you wrote the book with your young boy editors. Yeah, okay, so who are these? How many are they? I know. Who are people, the biggest surprise was nobody, like people didn't think I was gonna get boys to talk, right? Because mm -hmm. boys don't talk, they just say, it's good, I'm fine, don't worry about it. As, um, a, as a talk show host, <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Um, and, you know, here, what was amazing, as I'm sure you will can relate to, is that when you ask boys instead of, um, say, leading questions or you're judgmental about them or assume the worst about them, when you ask boys questions about their lives and you acknowledge the messiness of life and you acknowledge the double standards that they are constantly confronting. Um, if you say, can you please explain to me what your life looks like or what your world looks like and the things that are making you angry and frustrated or what you care about, that actually they're gonna talk. And they're gonna talk so much that they're not gonna stop talking. I mean, there were many, many times I had 200 boys that were actively involved for about two years, day in and day out with no reward, none, except for if they did a good job, I would write them a work recommendation or, or a college recommendation. Mm -hmm. And these boys went over every single thing of like, yeah, if you tell my mother that, that's gonna totally backfire, or this is what's happening in my life. Or what was so amazing was the boys, because it was over two years, went through very serious problems. Some of them were suspended. Some of them did terrible things. Um, sometimes they talked, to, one of them lost their mother during this process. And one of them had a horrendous fight at school where a girl initiated attack and was it was a horrible, horrible situation. The boys, when they would find out, all through the social networking that we created, would help each other. They would find out what the problem is, I would share it with them, and then they would check in on each other and say, how are you doing, how are you doing? So the process, the organic process of this, was the boys helping each other and learning. It was, it was frankly, it was one of the most, by far, one of the most rewarding work experiences I've yeah. had. There's there always this assumption that boys are cavemen, right? Yeah. And sometimes we, you know, we confirm that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It can but look like that. It can look like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly for some of the boys, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously they're human beings, they wind up doing interesting things with their lives. You might want to give them a chance when they're young. So I, I want to talk about the unwritten rules of boys in a second, but first just a quick note there. You, why, why shouldn't I ask my kid how uh, his school day went? <laughs> <laughs> so I think I make that mistake, right? I, I ask him every well, day, even though yeah. he's four. Right, right. right. <laughs> well, um, I get a lot of feedback from mothers in particular about um, my son doesn't talk to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I've been trying to express interest, and I just want to know what's going on with him. And all he says is, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And so when I was doing the initial work with the boys, I remember there was, I was in Kentucky, and I remember one of the boys saying, can you just do me this one favor? Just seriously, Rosalind, when you go talk to parents, just do me this one thing. Get them to stop talking to us at the end of the day when we get into the car, when they pick us up, when they whatever, 
just get them to stop asking us so many questions. And then the, another kid said, yeah, I want people to realize, I want my mom to realize or my dad to realize that it's like me waiting for them at the end of the workday. And they walk in from a really long workday and I'm standing there looking at them with these really intense eyes being saying, so how was your day? Did you answer all of your emails? So did you handle that person that you don't like at, you know, at, at work? Did you like, did they sabotage you? Do you want to role play it? Should we talk about it? Well, what are you going to do about it? And <laughs> it sounds like my life, actually, right? but anyway, yeah. <laughs> right? okay. And so the boys said, when we come home from school or from practice, we would just like to decompress for a few minutes and yet, what we're getting is this constant interrogation. And yeah, like I know sometimes they care and they're trying to, but it's not what it comes across as. Now what's been really interesting is, I've been talking to parents about this, and sometimes moms, I just did last week, mother said to me, I don't know if I can do it. And I said, can you just try, like how long is your trip from the time you pick them up after practice to your house? She said, 10 minutes. I said, I'm, ta I'm asking you to not do this for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Just when you see him, say hi, sweetheart, and like just something that you're glad that he's in the same space as you. Mm -hmm. Just do it for four days, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, I don't know if I can do that. I really don't know. Well, we can't ask our children to do things that we're not willing to do ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, it gets a little bit tiring when adults won't do, they hold children to the same standards that children are actually not supposed to be able to do because their brains aren't supposed to be developed to the point that they can you know, do these kinds of things and yet we're not, with all of our maturity, willing or able to do it. So, but uh, what am I supposed to ask him how his day went? Oh, yeah, well, you can't <laughs> ask them. I mean, you can't say, so, right, so you, you, when he gets in the car, you see him, express some kind of, like, affection, glad to see him. But then, you know, at the end of the day, depending on your, you know, your kid's little, right? So he's probably going to bed at 8.30. You know, he's not oh, going to I bed wish. at 1 o'clock. Okay, I wish. Right? <laughs> well, okay. as kids get older in general, uh -huh. you know, kids' parents' bedtimes and their kids' bedtimes change, right? right. They invert. So I think what's most important, though, is that some kind of end of the day that you, when it's quiet, you sit in, in his room and you like sit on his bed or you sit on his chair and you say, hey, just want to check in. Like, I just mm. want to know, like, what's up? Uh -huh. And not like that weird kind of, I want to know what's up. And you don't wait for a Hallmark conversation where the guy mm. like starts spilling his being, you know, just everything about you just, you know, he's like, he could still say, I'm good. It's all mm -hmm. good, right? Mm -hmm. You give him a kiss, you show some kind of affection, you walk out the door. Um, I've, what's most important to me is that I know, what I know from working for 20 years with boys, is that many of them are hiding very complicated, difficult situations in their lives, especially as they get into high school. Um, and they're not going to talk to us if we are constantly interrogating them or if we're freaking out. They're not going to do it. We have to come across as calm and loving and be able to see them and what they need. Because boys really are facing, I mean, they're facing drugs and alcohol, obviously, but they're also facing things of, fa of friends being, um, you know, racist things. They're, I mean, the amount of racism that kids are experiencing and don't know how to talk about it is huge. They don't like it. The amount of homophobia they're still dealing with, absolutely huge. The amount of hazing they're dealing with, sexual harassment, domestic, you know, relationship abuse. Boys are dealing with this and they care about it, but they don't know how to talk about it. So I, I want to talk about how they're dealing with it because I, I learned something really interesting in your book about that. Uh, but before we get to that, you say they're dealing with a lot of racism. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't. That's almost never discussed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. what do you mean by that? Well, I think there's a th there's an issue with the boys about and I was. I have worked with boys a very long time. I knew that boys would joke around with their friends. And one of the things that's nice about some communities in this country, some, not enough, that are racially integrated, is that boys are, there are some children in some communities that are used to being with people of different races and they have these really wonderful fluid conversations and they can joke with each other in, in warm ways but about kind of race stuff. Um, but, what I really realized going through this with the boys is that the amount of ignorance and racism that, and comments and um, exhaustion that boys of color feel with their white friends that um, is really something that they don't talk about. And that white kids, for example, will say, well, that's just what we say or that's just what we hear and so it doesn't mean anything and my friend who's black or this guy that I'm on the team with who's black never says anything about it. So, you know, he doesn't mind. And the kid, when you ask him, he's like, yeah, whatever, right? Because he's exhausted. He's exhausted dealing with the kind of ignorant comments that white kids will often say. And also, frankly, things were much more anti-Semitic than I thought. So it was really? really, yeah, really. So it was really common. So, you know, obviously we have a serious problem with white kids using the N-word 
and then they say to their they say, well, I just use it with an A, so it doesn't matter, and all right. this ridiculous stuff. And they don't know the history, they don't know the legacy, and they have set it up so that the kid of color is sitting there going, like, I cannot even deal with this. Right now, but to be fair to the white kids, they hear it in rap all the time. Yes, right? they do. And they so totally they grow do. up with it as one of the most common words that they hear in the art form that they most uh, listen to. True. Right. True. And so and so that's why it's interesting because from their perspective. They think this is a word that's used all the time, and my black friend is not objecting to it. From the black kid's perspective, he's thinking, what am I going to do, correct every white kid in the world, right? Yeah, but I think it's worse than that. It says, I think that, yeah, that's true. And like my kids listen to that music, and, I, and my boys listen to that music. And I think, first of all, parents aren't talking about racism beyond everyone is equal, right? That's yeah. what we say. We don't talk about like the actual complexities or the difficulties or when somebody says a racist joke, most of the time parents don't say anything to another person. The mm -hmm. um, same thing with homophobic jokes, I think, for the most part. But it's really what's difficult for the boys. And I think that, and I think that get, you know, yes, they're seeing it in the music, but there's a very big difference between that and like as described in, in Masterminds, one of my one of the my closest most wonderful kids that I worked with who never ever would have admitted this like you never would have seen this he was a lacrosse player he was in southern california and he was in the cafeteria and one of the white kids he made a joke one another kid at the table made a joke he made a joke back and another white kid said who let the nigger talk ooh that's not uh -huh. you, you don't see that like you're not uh -huh. like that white kid is not seeing that from some like you know, some rap video and then taking that to the cafeteria. That's not what's happening. What's happening is, is that there is inculcated racism that we won't deal with and that that boy, that that, and then what happens, of course, is that my kid, my editor, you know, gets really angry, right? And he wants to fight this kid. And then the other white kids say to him, because it was a majority white school, don't worry, don't worry, don't, don't worry, don't, and he just like, let it go, let it go. Well, why should he let it go, mm -hmm. right? Why should, so why shouldn't he have the right, why shouldn't he have the right to be able to, to, to call that kid out? Why does he have to be the person that has to control himself? So I want to talk, because that brings up bullying a little bit. I want to talk about proper response to that. There's so much to talk about. But, um, Can it, I just it's, say one more thing about this thing with the white yeah, parents? Yeah. There is no way. There, the majority of white parents that I work with, the vast majority of them, will say, there's no way my children would ever use that language, ever. Uh -huh. Not true. Not true, right? It, it's interesting because it, with the kids, it winds up becoming unfiltered, right? So with parents, like they are maybe savvy enough to filter it in the right context, right? In other contexts, apparently they don't filter. That's where the kids see it, right? Among and also in regular right. pop culture and stuff like that. And I, but I think homophobia is a little different because I think that that's a little bit more innate, okay? Sure. And so sure. we'll talk about why that is in, in a second, but. First, on this whole idea of uh, the thing that I learned from, from your book that I was like, oh right, that happened to me, right? Is um, how all boys are taught to get beyond it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and you're, that the Batman doesn't get in touch with his feelings, he kicks ass, <laughs> he doesn't smile, right, right et cetera. Right. And so I, like in football, I played high school football, uh, our coaches would say if you had an injury, they'd say spit on it, okay? Like just get on with it, okay? Right. Just I don't know why you're supposed to spit on it. It seems like that would make it worse. <laughs> Magic. But, right. Uh, so tell me about that phenomenon. Well, I mean, I think that there's. I mean, at base, I think one of the things that's amazing about you know, you it's important as a life skill to be able to get up and keep going, right? Mm -hmm. It's important. It is also important to understand that at a certain point you have to, that part of, get, of continuing, part of being able to keep going is recognizing when you can't keep going right now. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we lose, and it goes back, and it also con connects with bullying, is that I think lots of, lots of people were caught in this thing of we don't want to coddle children, um, and it seems like we're sort of in these two extremes, right? We don't want to coddle children, but we have to protect these children from these like horrible things that are happening. What's really important to me is to be able to say to, ch to kids, all right, you need to be, conflict's gonna happen, bad things are gonna happen, you're gonna get injured, and the important thing is to be able to recognize when you are at a place where you have to stop or where you need help or where you can't keep going at this moment. Not in general, not like for the rest of your life you can't keep going, mm -hmm. but like if you're concussed on the field, you need to realize that you got you can't just keep going. That that's not a sign of, sign of manhood and masculinity to just keep going right. because it is first certain you got to spit on it, right? First you have to spit on it, <laughs> okay. and then you actually have to use your brain to say, wait a minute. 
Am I pushing myself? And there's and there's wonderful things about pushing yourself, and it's really important as a teacher and as a parent, it's really important to teach kids to keep pushing yourself. A part of pushing yourself is realizing when you're over your head. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I, I remembered all the times people t said, and I think I might have said to my son, like, you know, uh, you're okay. Oh, you yeah. know, sure. uh, you're a tough guy. Right. You're going right. to be okay. Right. And that, and I realized reading uh, your book that that doesn't give him enough space to say, no, wait, actually, I'm a little hurt here. Let's <laughs> Just give me five seconds, right, please. Like, let's deal with that a little bit, <laughs> right. and then we'll get beyond right. it, and we'll figure right. out a way to get beyond it. So that's interesting too. And it's also important. You can cry through, you know, continuing to play. You can cry. Like it's important to be able to say to actually allow the child to have a moment to say to like, are you know. Are you okay to look at this child? And I, you know, I was thinking when you were talking about this with parents, so oftentimes we get so focused on you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, that we're not seeing the child for who they are. Like mm -hmm. we're not looking at them and saying, what does this child need? Mm -hmm. And what the child learns with this, it's okay, it's okay, keep going, keep going, without the space of just taking a breath and acknowledging, okay, I'm in pain, but I can get through it is I can't even have those feelings in the first place. I'm not allowed to have them. See, that's really interesting, because that gets embedded in you. And so you, you feel like I'm not allowed to be hurt, right? Right. right? And so, and that has a lot of ramifications Huge. throughout your Huge. life, right? Huge. Huge. And and if I do feel hurt, I'm supposed to shut it down, right? And so instead of acknowledging it and dealing with it, right? So th then that becomes psychological, etc. Well, right. And it also think about all the things that boys. You know, it's amazing. We want boys to do the right thing and be courageous, morally courageous, ethically courageous. And yet, so much of what we do is shut is shut down their right to have emotional reactions to things. To be, if you have an emotion, if you are going to be galvanized and motivated to speak your truth to power, you better have a very. You're, you have to have a strong emotion to be, get that motivation. If we are shutting boys down constantly, with all different kinds of messaging about just be quiet or let it roll off your back. Why would we be surprised that they wouldn't roll things roll off their back no matter what, no matter where they are? When oh, they're in a locker room, when they are seeing things on the field, when they see screwed up situations, they are trained to roll everything off their back. And then what's amazing is that we get incredibly angry at them and think there's something wrong with the moral, fi moral fiber of our, this generation of youth because they're letting things roll off their back. We train them to do that and then we blame them when they do. That's a great, great insight. And then it also spills over to when you're an adult. So you don't challenge authority, whether it's, you know, exactly. you know p people in power, the government, et cetera, because, we, because we taught you to have just, oh, let it go. Let it roll off exactly. your back. Right. Exactly. No, I had a good combination of your book and my wife, who's a therapist. <laughs> and like, uh -huh. well, the one thing she taught me that was really great is if they hurt themselves, mm -hmm. don't say you're all right right away. Say, hey, it hurts, doesn't it? And he, and he goes, yes, yes, it does hurt, right? Now let me tell you, it's going to be okay tomorrow. Exactly. I know it hurts today, but exactly. you know. It's, so all right. Wise woman. Okay. Yes, she is. Don't tell her that. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so now, uh, Cerebral, uh, which let's yeah. transitioning to bullying, sure. right? Uh, there's for the people who don't know, the Cerebral high school football team got in a lot of trouble because they do, uh, and what I think is an extreme form of hazing, and it might be more prevalent than we realize. No, but something about hanging the freshmen upside down, holding them upside down, and then one of the seniors puts a digit, one of his digits, uh, into the kid's rectum. Okay, I said that as blood. I was I just gonna say. Uh -huh. okay. um, and so, it's a couple of interesting notes here. Uh, I come from East Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, Cerebral was one of our top rivals. As I was reading that story, I was most surprised at how good their football team has got. <laughs> Because <laughs> okay, we used to maul them, but yeah, anyway, yeah, they've um, gotten good recently. Yeah, mm -hmm. they have. It's amazing. Anyway, uh, and and we used to do some hazing at, at my team. Uh, now, I was I don't know why I was, but I was a unique kid in that I didn't put up with it. I didn't put up with it as a fr s sophomores when we joined the high school in, in yeah. our particular town, and I didn't put up with it when I was a senior. So, uh, but that's not usually what happens, right? So. How does the pinky in the butt thing or whatever get started? How do you stop it? Why does it happen? Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for as long as I've been working in schools, this kind of stuff has been going on. I mean, I've been dealing with, with schools, and a lot of times I have to tell you that a lot of the adults know about it and they turn their back. And um, I don't know exactly what happened at this school system, mm -hmm. but what I do know is that there is a culture of permission and a culture, there has to be a culture of permission and a culture of, if I get caught, I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not gonna be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And these are all things that are unsaid, right? You don't need to say them specifically for the boys to get it. 
Um, and what's also amazing to me is that, you know, I work with a lot of coaches and, uh, and my sons play football. My son plays football. And the, the power that football coaches has to have to raise these boys to be honorable men is so extraordinary. And yet at the same, and unfortunately, these coaches have the power to take the worst of power and entitlement and allow the boys to abuse it. Um, my, my son's football coach talked to them about Ray Rice. My son's in eighth grade. I could not have been more proud and more, um, more happy to have, my, to have these men, these, male, you know, these coaches in my life and in mm -hmm. my son's life. They are instrumental in teaching my son what, it, what an outstanding man should be. Mm -hmm. um, but what I see time and time again is that when we have, especially when boys are successful in the things that we want them to be culturally successful in, like football, where it fits this model of like American mas masculinity, that when we have boys who do that, that it even really incites the adults to even more be in denial and disbelief and then dismiss the reality of what they've got in front of them, which is a complete and blatant abuse of power. And it is extraordinary to me, especially when I mean, some of the people, some of the parents who have been apologizing or excusing the behavior are mothers. I mean, it's really extraordinary to think about that in terms of our own, our, as a mother, of our own mothering towards how we raise our boys. Um, and so what's important to me is, this, is really about how do we stop this kind of stuff? We can have boys who achieve right in these ways and at the same time constantly be saying to them, because you are good on the field makes you no less be, to be held accountable as an honorable man. And this is what this looks like to me. And if the coaches were in the locker room, and some coaches will take not, they won't take responsibility. They'll say, well, I don't, the locker room is the boys' space. I don't want to be there. So they'll throw the jerseys at the boys and walk out. Good coaches know that anywhere where those boys are is the coach's space. And so, and that is an important moment of right. being able to exercise power. So the, the coach I get, so I think that that's a big responsibility and that's his, Sure. and I, in every uh, competitive environment that I've been in, uh, and I've played a lot of different sports, the coach sets the tone, I understand, and then some of the team leaders and captains which the coach chooses and right. sets the tone with in that regard as well. Uh, but I think what's the hardest question is what do you do uh, when the bullying is happening in your kid, right? Mm -hmm. And whether you're the kid who's being hung upside down or right. you're one of the witnesses or they right. ask you to participate. So now I know what I did, but I'm not sure I want to tell my son to do the same thing. Okay. okay. So what well, I did, what yeah, I did okay. when when mm -hmm. when they were going to haze us was who do I need to fight? Okay. I bring me the biggest senior and I will kick his ass, but we're not going to I'm not going to let you do this. Right. Okay. Right. So now I don't know that I want to tell my son that. Right. And when I was a senior, I, again, who do I need to fight, right? right. Because I'm not going to let you do that, right? right? So hazing to me, like, oh, you carry our shoulder pads, you bring the right. waters, perfectly right. fine, right? right. That's right. a ritual, rite of passage, etc. We're going to go take a, we're going to pee on the kids. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's we're, your line. <laughs> right. Yeah, we're not going to do that, right? Yeah. So, but how do I tell them to stop it without telling them to fight? Well, th first of all, I think that um, having somebody... Um, I think what's hap what happened in Sarahville is sexual assault. So I think that's an important thing to differentiate or to be able to name because mm -hmm. we don't like to name it when we're talking about boys. Um, the second part is that I think that violence is one of the, um, self-defense and violence are one of the most dishonest conversations that we have in schools mm -hmm. with children. So what we say to children all the time is use your words, use your words, use your words, right? Mm -hmm. You tell that to a sophomore boy in that, in that uh, locker room at Sarahville and what is he going to do? One of the things that's really important is we say things to boys and they look at you and they're like, you have no clue what I am dealing with. Right. Therefore, I am not going to talk to you about what's going on because if I talk to you, you are going to give me information or advice that is in no way relevant to the situation that I have in hand right now. That's exactly right. So that's why boys have, look at us, like, <laughs> like, why do I even, why do I even bother, right? So, but then what's the answer? Well, so I actually think, and, and this is not, I am not, let's see, in the group of most people in education, but I think that when somebody is going to assault you, I think that you get to defend yourself. I think mm. you get to physically defend yourself to the extent that, and I go over this with, I go over this with the boys in the guide, is that you get to defend yourself to the extent that the threat is, right? So you don't ever escalate and get to the point where you are over, you're over dominating somebody. So That's the a, problem is what you tell. Oh, wait, one second. You're going to get in trouble for school.
school at school for that, right? Right. Right. And I think that what we have to do, and I've worked, I worked a lot, excuse me, a lot of um, administrators, is that good administrators understand that there are situations where you have to defend yourself, and the moment where the ch where the administrator actually um, disciplines the child, like significantly disciplines the child, is when they initiate the assault. But good administrators, if a child is defending themselves, I'm talking about high school or middle school and high school, the kid is not going to be a good administrator, an intelligent administrator, a strategic administrator, is not going to see it as just, oh, this kid fought, and therefore I'm just going to suspend him, and that's it. That's not the way it works. So the problem is, is what you tell your kids as a parent, because look, I, I think that I actually did almost exactly what you suggest when I was a kid, right? I would neutralize the threat and I would go no further, right. right? So I would fight the senior and would get to a point where I put him in the Uger headlock and we were done, okay? Right. And I didn't need to go any right. further right. It's, and there was no retribution and, and there is a natural pecking order. They, they know after a while that power gets established like, okay, don't mess with Jenk. If yeah. he says don't pee on the kids, don't pee on the kids because <laughs> he will put you in the Uger headlock yeah. and then you're done, okay? Right. So, so yes, that's all true, but as a parent, how do I tell, am I supposed to tell my kid to fight under certain circumstances? Yeah, I think you do, I do. Oh, and wow. I know that this is okay. not, I know that most people and certainly, you know, I think that when you're in a situation where somebody is physically assaulting you, that you get the right, you have the right to defend yourself. And I think there are ethics about that. You need to understand, and I write to the book, and I have a lot of martial arts experience. So this is, I might be coming at this from a different, different way than most educators do, but um, but I believe very strongly as a woman that when I learned how to defend myself, my entire sense of self changed. That I knew that I, I could defend myself meant, okay, I don't have to depend on anyone else to be able to do that for me. Mm -hmm. And it was an extraordinarily empowering experience to go through. And for boys, when I talk to them about fighting, it's that you have to know that there's gonna be something about the fight that goes not the way you planned. Mm -hmm. It's gonna hurt no matter how much martial arts experience or whatever badass you think you are, it's mm -hmm. gonna hurt. Mm -hmm. um, there are gonna be things maybe that you regret about it, but there are ethics involved about not escalating the fight, about not starting the fight. But if you are clearly somebody who is being targeted, then I don't see how it is fair to a boy to say, use your words. <laughs> okay, but one last thing about that. So yes, if you are assaulted and you have to defend yourself, then that gets a little easier. Although with boys, it's really tricky in trying to draw that line for them. Because they will, if you give them that permission, any provocation can lead to a self-defense. Sure. Where then all of a sudden they're punching the other kid in the eyeball. Sure. As my son says, I'm gonna punch him in the yeah, eyeball. No, 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 don't, don't, don't do that, don't do that. But he's forced. They're just, right, right. You know, they have. They're it's right. harder to set boundaries right. and yeah. Uh, but what if you're the witness, right? So you're there. They're hanging the kid upside down. You're really uncomfortable with it. What are you supposed to do? I would like for so let's go back to, to for a moment two things one is if this was happening to girls in the in the same situation we would absolutely say to the girls i think you need to physically you have the right to physically defend yourself now there'd be a whole conversation of if they could or not but we i just want people to understand the double standard that we sometimes put on boys about mm -hmm. as violent as we think boys are how often we tell them not to fight it's really a weird mm -hmm. juxtaposition the second thing is is that with roles and boys is that the bystander stuff happens where the boys are friends or they're aligned with each other and then this moment happens of conflict or abuse of power and all of this stuff of rolling things off your back or not speaking truth to power, just being like it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, all of this stuff crystallizes in that moment and that's when bystanders can't speak. It's really like, <gasps> I can't talk. I can't do this. And I've talked to so many boys about this. You know, good guys that are six foot four who are phenomenal athletes who have tremendous social power who go, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And then their feeling of masculinity and of them, like, who am I as a man, completely is crushed that they can't speak out about it. Mm -hmm. But they carry it with them. They're silent and they carry it with them. So for boys as bystanders, what I want them to do, but they need practice with this. And so that means we have to have honest conversations with them about they actually are going to be in situations like this. You will probably be in a situation where somebody's gonna do something so jacked up and twisted that you are not, for a moment, you're not gonna know what to do. Here's what we want you to do. And then walk it through with the boys and say, so you go to the person with the most social power. You say directly to them exactly what you want stopped. So remember you said about the mastermind, he's mm -hmm. really good at giving directions. Right. People follow 
directions. When somebody comes up to the perpetrator and says, take that boy off the hooks and put him down on the ground, strangely enough, people take direction. Mm -hmm. So if you if we give boys the practice about this, we don't have to have these like, you know, stop this, she is, you are hazing him. That's the kind of stuff that we say to boys. It's get that kid off the off of this peg right now and put him down on the ground right now. Mm -hmm. Get your hands off of him, mm -hmm. right? Because then you, of course, can pry, not pry, take advantage of the boy's homophobia mm -hmm. because the perpetrators who are doing this, the moment you say take your hands off of him, mm -hmm. the boys are like, no, I know, that's uh, the right? immediate thing I, I thought when I saw the cerebral thing is, and, I, and, and it's, it's double-edged sword, it and, is. but it is. I would have said, why, are you having fun doing this? It's, it's right? double-edged sword. Right, so then they go, whoa, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it, that's right? That's right. But on the other hand there, you've opened up the Pandora's box of homophobia, right, so. I don't think you have. I think okay. what you have is, Sexual assault is about power. It looks like power and exploitation of power no matter what. You go after people regardless, because of what is perceived to be weakness. That's why you're going after them. So you are exploiting and abusing power, and that's what it looks like right here. Okay, so let's, let's come back to this, what I said was some degree of innate homophobia, because I think we need to address that sure, before sure. Uh, we end this uh, conversation, which is, could go on forever, because I love this topic. Um, so. What is it about like you're haha ha, you're gay that guys love to say to other guys? Why is that? And is there a way to stop it? I mean, I feel like that's bigger than racism. I think it's more in some ways it's a weird way of putting it, but more natural than racism. Doesn't mean it's more right. Common. It's more more com yeah, more mm -hmm. common. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean it's right at all. Right. So it, it makes it harder to combat. I think. Right. Sure. So so why is that? Well, I mean, I think that from very early ages, um, adults in children's lives and boys' lives compare per, like perform, you know, poor performance of girls and emasculation. So that boys at very early ages learn that whatever is perceived to be weaker or less masculine or and or a girl is um, shameful. And from there, it's a very quick jump to what is perceived to be, you know, people who are sexually attracted to the same to men who are attracted or boys who are attracted to other boys. And then what they do, what boys say all the time, I have these conversations endlessly, I did with 700 boys yesterday, seventh grade boys, is this thing of it doesn't matter, it's just, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, we just say it's so gay because it's stupid. And so my response to that is, if you're go you cannot use shorthand ways to put people down, right, mm -hmm. of like who you inherently are, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what we mean. Look at your look at where it's coming from. Know what's coming out of your mouth. I say this to kids all the time. I can't control what comes out of their mouth because I can't. No parent can, no teacher can, they have to. So if they it's a moment of thinking, am I when I look in the mirror, do I believe that I have the right to put people down just because of who they inherently are? Just do I believe that? Mm -hmm. If you do, then there's not much I can do for you, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like the, there are kids who will say, Yep, yeah, I do. Right? Mm -hmm. Well then I get it. I get that's your there, then you have you feel that you have that right. Um, then I can get to them in a whole different kinds of ways. But the thing about an adult saying to a child, and adults don't do this enough, if, is you may not use these words to put people down, period. There's no documentary we need to have, there's no long conversation we'd have to have. There are so many adults who allow this kind of stuff to happen, and the reason why they do when kids are little is because they think if it's in front of their child and they hear this stuff happening, that if they say anything about it, that their child is gonna socially suffer. So if they mm, say, yeah, yeah. You know, don't say that. That's not you know like that you know like They're that kind of stuff. They're afraid that if they say st uh, stop the other guy from saying that's gay, that it's going to get turned around and they say, oh yeah, you're gay, and oh then the parent parents are in a panic. Right. Or, they don't and, want their yes, kid being called yes, gay. Yes. Or like and you, somehow the other children are not going to like their child because the parent was uh, you know somebody who said something like that. Right, and what I right. say to parents all the time is, kids don't. There might be another reason why children don't like your child, but it's not that. If anything, they're going to feel sorry for you for having a hard ass as a parent. But <laughs> But that's about it. That's really it. But parents don't say this. They go, oh, I don't want to do this because it's going to hurt my kid and I don't want to, it's going to come back on my kid and I don't want to do it. Well, we have to have these like values declaration statements. Otherwise, the boys just look at you like, yeah, whatever. Okay, there's so much more in these books that you got to check out. Masterminds and Wingmen, uh, the adults, you're going to want to read this to, uh, to talk to your kids, to your sons specifically. And the guide is actually for boys. They say boys don't read, that's nonsense, okay? A lot of boys read, otherwise we wouldn't have gotten to the place we are, right? And it also has tips for how to pick up girls. It does. Okay, which I'm like, all right, now but we're having a conversation. And, all, yeah. <laughs> okay. and also what happens when you get picked, uh, when you get pulled over by a law enforcement officer. 
Okay, you yes. fight, right? No, no, no don't, <laughs> exactly. don't do that. Don't do no, that. you say I pay your taxes. I pay your salary. Do you know, do you know who my dad is? That usually works. No, really no, well. no, don't say any of that. <laughs> okay. All right, Rosalind Wiseman, thank you so much for joining us. My really pleasure. appreciate it. My pleasure.